The Heart Below Zero Written by Leon Won the Lion and David Pugzak Calvin walked into a room holding a comic book. His little boy and girl, who were bouncing upon the bed, became even more excited seeing him hold it. How are my children tonight? he asked. Are you ready to go to bed? he said with a wink and a smile. The little kids cried out no, as they expected him to read tonight, as he did every night. They protested and explained that he was supposed to read to them. Ah, said the father, so you want me to read a story and then you can go to bed. The little children cried out now again. Oh, so you just want to go to bed without reading stories, replied Calvin. No, they cried out. We want you to read all night long. All night, he said in a shocked voice. Wouldn't that be well past your bedtime? He asked, prodding them again. No bedtime, they cried out. He gave a hearty laugh and said, All right, sitting down in the chair. The two children immediately climbed up on him and sat in his lap so he could read to them. I don't think we're going to skip bedtime, but we can definitely read a comic. He showed them the comic's cover and read the title. Ultra Warm, The Last Issue, Can a Frozen Heart Be Warmed? It can't be the end, his little boy whined. Ultra Warm has to keep fighting more bad guys. He looked into his daddy's eyes, hoping he was joking. Well, we'll just have to find out, said Calvin, opening the comic book, and began to read it. His children began getting very excited as he got to the very end of the comic book, reading aloud. Our heart is cold, Ultra Warm. You are never going to warm us up, and you're never going to get to Dr. Zero. One of the henchmen said to Ultra Warm, He's going to turn the whole world like us, and then we'll never be outcasts again. Once everyone is the same, no one will be hated anymore. There is no cold that can't be warmed up with love, he replied, parrying with his forearm one of the kicks from a figure cloaked in darkness. Then he grabbed him by the shin. With a hard yank, pulled them toward himself, grabbing their upper body and embracing them upon his chest. A warm glow came from Ultra Warm. The darkness disappeared around him, and the temperature rose by a few degrees. The other goons attacked him, and they all fell the same way. After the warmest hug they'd ever felt, they realized in tears that somebody actually loved them. Now, go home, all of you, to the warmth of your homes and to your families. You don't have to be afraid anymore. I will melt Dr. Zero's heart as well, he said with a voice that could cut through the cold like a spring wind after the winter and started down the corridor, the corridor getting deeper into the lair of the villain. Calvin's phone rang and his kids got worried that he would disappear as he listened to the sound of the only phone in the house ringing on the counter. He knew his wife would grab it in a minute, but he looked into his children's eyes, worried that he might be leaving for the night. Don't worry, he told them. It's probably just Mommy's wife. Mommy doesn't have a wife, they protested. She's married to you. Oh, said Calvin. I forgot. Sometimes she talks to everyone else so much, I think she's married to them, he chuckled at his own joke. No, Daddy, they protested. You're married to Mommy. All right, junior detectives, he said. How do you prove it? He gave them a wink and waited for their answer. His boy stated that it was because he was his dad and she was his mom. His daughter stated that it was because they gave each other hugs and kisses every day and that's what made them married to each other. He gave a hearty laugh at both of them before his wife marched into the room, saying it was for him. And will you stop telling the children I have a wife, she said with a resenting voice. I'll see you in a minute, he said. I gotta take care of this. He gave them a kiss on the forehead before leaving. Disappointed, the children reluctantly got off his lap and watched him leave. He got to the phone and listened for a few minutes before hanging it up. He turned to his wife. Sorry, Rose. I have to go check on the Willisons. They were supposed to check in today, but no one has heard from them, Calvin said. Their younger boy, Jade, had his magic going out of control, so I need to go see what the situation is. You're a detective. Why are they sending you and not an officer? 
his wife protested. Calvin knew she was trying to talk him out of leaving, and that she was stalling for time, afraid that he may never come back. She did this quite often, but tonight she was looking at him like it was the last time she would ever see him. It'll be okay, Calvin replied. The worried look only got worse. He realized there was nothing he could do to calm her down. He could only explain why he had to go. It's a small town, Calvin replied. We don't have a division for handling magic like the bigger cities. The detective division is more equipped to handle the magic than the police officer division, mostly because of the amount of research we do on magic. So we've been given the job to deal with these sorts of things when they occur. I don't see why all of this is necessary, she said. Why don't they just seal away people's magic if they can't control it? I wish it was that easy, Calvin replied. But with magic having a mind of its own, it can be pretty hard to do sometimes. We've tried sealing his magic multiple times, but he keeps breaking the seals. It does have a will of its own, and that will is usually to be useful to its partner, he stated. His wife stared at him with a blank face. When did you start believing that magic was its own entity, she asked him. Calvin could feel her buying time, her eyes still begging him not to leave. It took a moment to reply. I suppose I have changed my mind on that, haven't I? There was another possibility, I guess. I didn't even notice. I've been looking into it a lot with me being a detective and seeing all the reports from the other scientists. Technology hasn't really caught up to the level where people can fully understand magic, and yet the government is just as slow to acknowledge it as the general public. Everyone wants to have the same level of understanding of magic that humanity had before technology began to catch up with it leaving it mysterious and unknown. But that's besides the point, love. I need to get going, he said, kissing her on the forehead. She stood up on her toes, kissing him. She was already missing him, as though she would never see him again, and held him like she would never let him go. He let her go, much to her dismay. His two kids walked into the room and gave him the, the ultra-warm hug of protection that he had read to them in the comics. He gave a hearty laugh and gave the ultra-warm hug of protection back before giving them a kiss, saying goodbye. As he left, he took one last look at his wife, holding his children's hands, looking at him as though she would never see him again, on the verge of tears. He headed towards his car, reading the Roaring Unicorn logo on it. He loved his car as he ran his fingers down the hood before opening the door and firing up the engine, listening to it purr. After a minute, he reached for the phone, hooked up to the magic mirror. In every detective's car, the rearview mirror was a magic mirror. They could even see each other, and it didn't require any energy. It also worked anywhere, even underground. It was set up to be used in a more conventional system, so they were able to make phone calls with it now. How it worked eluded Calvin, but all that he knew, he understood the basics a little bit, knowing that it was a combination of magic and technology now, allowing him to call people on the landline. His police station was the first to test out the prototypes as they worked wonderfully so far. He called his partner, Devin. All right, Devin replied. I've been pulling up the information we have on the families and calling some of their relatives and neighbors. Apparently, nobody's heard from them in a week, he said. Devin, you work too hard, Calvin said. You need to relax a little bit. Everything is going to be okay. I'm sure they just forgot to call in, and they've been trying to help their child. When Devin got into the car, he immediately took the time to talk about everything they knew about the family, reading directly from the oldest report they had going forward. The youngest child in the family is a magic host. He's most likely a newborn magic hive, given that magic can reproduce on its own. Like many single-celled organisms, we are not sure of where it came from or who was the original host of its ancestor. Devin, Calvin said, giving him a passive-aggressive glare. You really need to stop breaking this habit of reading the entire report. I've read it, and I don't need it read back to me. 
You never know when old information will trigger a new idea, Devin replied. It's best to be extra thorough. There was a moment of odd silence, as the two could feel each other's glares on them, even though they weren't looking at the other detective. They both ran through their heads the previous arguments that they had made the last time they got started on this. They both evaluated that it wasn't worth arguing over again, and Devin began reading the reports again while Calvin rolled his eyes. The child had magic for at least four years that we're aware of. At first, it was not that big of a problem, as they had the child in for training to control it, as well as getting it sealed. A few years ago, he began getting bullied for being different, and it seems like that's when the problems began, when his emotions were disheveled. He began to lose control of his power, his family and friends would soon start getting little nips of freezes from being around him, so they began to distance themselves further and further from him. They could both feel their stomachs churning, as this was a hard one to read. The psychiatrist that he was seeing, Dr. Smith, had reported that he was starting to feel more and more lonely, and it would seem to escalate his powers going out of control. About three months ago, due to him not being able to control his power anymore because of bullying, he was put into homeschool. A week ago, they took a vacation to try and help the family get back together, but nobody's heard from them since, and they missed their report that they were supposed to submit today. Perhaps they forgot because they were making progress, Calvin said, as they pulled up. There was an odd chill about the house, with icicles hanging off the deck and frost unusually accumulating on the front porch and on parts of the grass as well, even though it was well into spring. Better take this, Devin handed Calvin a talisman. It's the new stay warm talisman that the department developed. We should be safe as long as we have these. The two climbed out of their car and began to investigate the surroundings around the house that the Willisons had rented. As I said, maybe they're just chilling inside and forgot to report, Calvin said. But as the words left his mouth, he knew that they were not true, no matter how bad he wanted them to be. Don't think so, Devin replied with a cold voice. He examined the whole house and the surrounding area, looking at all the snow and ice, slowly melting in the place furthest away from the buildings, staying cold next to the house. Calvin fished out a lens from the inner pocket of his coat and looked through it, trying to locate the source of the magic and any traps or danger that could harm them. They didn't need the lens to find the source. It was clear as daylight. It was coming from the frozen house. But Calvin still held it up before his eyes, controlled by force of habit and pure fear. They could never be sure its power was malicious or if it would go wild just like it did before. Magic was just as dangerous when it went rogue as it was useful while people could keep it under control. And it was not just some blind force like electricity that could be harnessed and enslaved. It had a mind and will of its own. They listened at the door from inside. A faint, distorted sob could be heard. At least somebody's alive, Devin said. Maybe they're all alive, Calvin replied, frustrated. They knocked on the door repeatedly, trying to see if anybody would reply. When nobody did, they tried entering the dwelling. They found that the door was unlocked, but something was wedged at the bottom. They both rammed the door at the same time. It took three tries before it finally gave, and they broke in. The lower portion stayed in place. It was completely frozen solid. They looked around the house, seeing it was covered in ice and water vapor in the air, crystallizing and settling on the furniture like a fine covered snow. Inside, it was deadly cold. They both pulled their coats tighter and then looked for a switch to turn on the lights. They found it, but it was frozen solid, so they turned their flashlights on instead. They started going in the direction of the weeping, which was becoming louder and louder as they approached it. First, they heard only fragments of words, and then they heard some full sentences, as well as muttering mixed in with the crying. And in the back bedroom, they finally found the little boy, whose magic went rampant, leaving the entire room cased in ice. 
Their hearts skipped a beat as they found him frozen to his bed, covering himself with the sheets as though he was in the process of shielding himself from something but didn't finish. Standing over him, trying to shield his body, was an ice golem, which seemed to be the only living thing as it cried out. Please, don't hurt me. This is my body. I must protect it. Mom, Dad, please. I mean it. I'll be good. I didn't want to hurt anyone. Please forgive me. Please. I'll make it right, Dad. I promise, Mom. I didn't mean to, he muttered to himself, not even noticing the two detectives who shone their lights on him. They shifted the rays of their torches to the center of the room where the golem was facing. There was a big pile in the center of the room. At first, it was hard to make out what it was. Devin almost threw up as he realized he was looking at the family, frozen in time with terror and shock on their faces, the mother and father trying to protect their little child with their bodies. But there was no escape from the cold and they were all turned into grotesque ice statues. Calvin looked back at the golem with feelings of pity and dismay. It was not his fault, yet it was. Then, in the light of the torch, he saw that the golem bent down and picked up an object. It was a comic covered in ice. The book was open to the last page showing the end. Calvin recognized it immediately as the comic book he was reading to his children. Then the ice golem began to read from the page. Ultra Warm could feel the temperature dropping even lower as he headed down the corridor which led to the den of Dr. Zero. You are finally here, the mad scientist dressed in shadows exclaimed. Dr. Zero, I came to put an end to your suffering. You'll never feel the cold of being alone anymore. Let me give you an embrace so warm, so tender, that it was never given before, Ultra Warm replied, taking a step closer. I have the perfect plan to never feel alone anymore. I'll freeze everyone so no two people can find each other in the dark on a cold night anymore. What I feel will not be called loneliness anymore. It will just be how things are from today. I just need to deal with you first, Ultra Warm. And as he reached into the shadows surrounding him, he pulled out a freeze ray gun. Witness my freeze ray. He let out a mad laugh and aimed the ray at Ultra Warm, then pulled the trigger. Steam rose as the ray hit Ultra Warm's chest, but he took a step in the direction of the doctor, and then another, and then another. When there was no more steps between the two, the hero reached his arms and hugged the villain with everything he had left. The shadows disappeared and the temperature rose as the doctor hugged Ultra Warm back. But it was too much even for such a hero. He collapsed almost immediately. He exhausted all that he had. The doctor started crying now, finally freed from his curse. The The glacier tears in his eyes melted. Crying, the golem dropped the comic book and turned towards his family. No, father, I'll be good from now on. I promise, okay? The golem sobbed as he crawled toward the pile of bodies. I promise I won't hurt anyone. Please, don't think of me as Dr. Zero. I don't want to be like him. I want to be like Ultra Warm. I can save you. Please, just don't hurt me. It'll be quick. And then everything will be okay. I can save you just like Ultra Warm saved the villain. And then I'll be gone and you guys will be back. And you'll all be safe, he said, crying. Wincing at nothing, he paused, covering himself, fearing the wrath of his family for something wrong that he may have done. When nothing happened, he continued towards his family. Once there, he opened his arms and tried to embrace his family members. It'll be okay, he said. I'll save you with the warmest hug. You won't have to be cold anymore. The ice golem stayed there for several minutes. Calvin decided he would break the silence to help the golem. Devin protested, but Calvin went anyways. He touched the golem's shoulder gently. They are gone now. We should go, he said with compassion. Who are you? The childish 
the golem asked, shielding his face, as though he was expecting to be scolded or attacked. I am Detective Calvin, he replied. I came here to help you guys. The detectives only show up at the end when everything is over. I need a hero to save my family. Someone to stop the bad before it happens, the golem said, distraught. Calvin opened his mouth to protest, but he never got a chance. The temperature in the room dropped immediately, and Calvin felt the teeth of a cold snap at his fingers on the shoulder of the ice golem. He tried pulling his hand away, but it was stuck, and he had to slide it out of his glove, leaving the glove on the ice golem's shoulder. Run, he shouted, and they did. Devon was already picking up on what was about to happen and was headed for the door. Icicles shot from the ice golem and began tearing up the room while a strange, low groan emerged from his throat. It exploded after them, and Devon could feel it coming. He slipped one arm out of his coat and then the other, dropping to a slide using his coat as a makeshift shield. He found that the coat stopped most of the ice as he was on the outskirts of the icy wave, but his leg was stuck as the coat didn't cover it. He looked back, calling out for Calvin, but found that he was completely frozen, his torch causing an icy glow to glow around him. Devin's heart felt like it stopped beating as he looked at his partner, completely cased in ice, unable to move. He began trying to get out, but his foot wouldn't let him, so he pulled out his gun and shot at the ice until it broke, leaving him limping towards the car with a frozen once out at their car, Devon radioed the station using the magic mirror. We need magic users at 14 Chasm Lane. This one has gone completely wild. We can't stop it, he exclaimed from the sprint. My partner's down. We need medical help immediately. We already know, replied a voice. The talisman you gave us note as soon as you, as they were active, and we started prepping men to go after you. According to the talisman, your leg is frozen, and Calvin is completely frozen. The appropriate team and medics are on en route to your direction right now. The only thing we don't know is what the full situation is with the child. Can you fill us in? Devin spent the next several minutes explaining the situation and how the team needed to handle it when they got there. The Soon the support team arrived to subdue and take away the ice golem. After that, they carried out the body of Calvin completely cased in ice. Devon looked as they loaded him on the stretcher into the ambulance. His flashlight was dimming and then started to flicker before going completely dark. After that, they loaded the rest of the family onto other ambulances to go to the hospital. Devon knew Calvin's wife personally, and he couldn't live with himself not telling her. He went to her house that night with a crutch in one arm. The medics advised him not to, but he couldn't not do it. He got there and rang the doorbell. Rose answered the door. She was shy and hesitant once she saw Devon there instead of Calvin. She was on the verge of breaking down. I'm sorry, Devon said. He choked, trying to get the rest of the words out, but he couldn't. He didn't have to. Rose already knew and began breaking down into tears. Two weeks later, Devon stood outside of the containment chamber of the ice golem, looking over the report he'd written. He was hoping maybe he could find a way to help the creature, but couldn't. The conclusion was that the magic believed that he was the child that he was bound with, and it made it and made his personality completely his own. Then, when they tried to bury all of his family, the magic was still attached to the boy. This caused him to break containment and find his body. When he got there and dug it up, he saw the graves of the rest of the family and began digging them up as well, as he loved them just as the little boy did. They could do nothing to stop him. He was like a blizzard, becoming more unstable when they tried to separate him from his family. So they moved the bodies here, hoping it would... He kept the room below zero so they would not decompose. Although 
they're not sure that was his intention. He kept reading from the last page of Ultra Warm, trying to mimic what he did to save his family. Devin found that the ice golem was in such a confused state it almost seemed as if it was. Devin found that the ice golem was in such a confused state it almost seemed as if it was reliving the same day over and over again. He always tried to hug his family and bring them back to life in exchange for his own, and then would fail, causing him to go crazy, and this happened every single day. They've tried counseling and memory erasing, but nothing helped him so far. No one was sure if he would ever recover. Most likely he'd be in this state for the rest of his life. X out that people running out of hope he would ever recover. He turned to see Calvin walking up to him. He seemed a little surprised to see him there. They finally let you out of the hospital. Weren't your injuries pretty bad? Devon greeted him. They weren't too bad, he said. The talisman you gave me right before we went stopped my body from going so cold it wouldn't freeze, but it let it go cold enough to shut down all of my organs, meaning that I didn't need oxygen, but I was in a sort of cryo state. I think that's what they called it, he said, scratching his head. It sure is amazing what the research and development crews have come up with. He complimented the device that saved his life. The two of them embraced in a hug. Good to have you back, said Devin, giving him a pat on the back. It's good to be back, Calvin replied, returning the pat. All right, let's go, said Devin, walking down the hallway with Calvin following him. Where are we going? Calvin asked. To talk to the commissioner, of course, said Devin. I have a request for him. I have a request for him. Calvin seemed a little confused about what was going on. Well, Devin replied, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what the ice golem had said before he went crazy. About how we always show up after everything and never stop anything. And so seeing how you survived because of the heat talisman. I've come up with an idea. We should use our skills as a detective to help the families get proper equipment. I mean, when such problems arise to save their lives. You mean like giving people talismans to protect them from magic when it goes rogue like that? Calvin asked, somewhat surprising. Of course, said Devin. We should always be looking forward to the future and make it a much better place. It's Too Late, written by Leon the Lion and David Pusak. The woods are dimly illuminated by whatever light source can reach through the tight-woven canopy of the trees. You try to keep to the middle of the group as you make your way through the forest. Everyone is on edge, tiptoeing around trying not to make a sound. You listen to danger, you look out for danger, you feel around for danger. People feel that any time, some nameless monstrosity could crawl out of the shadows. And the shadows stir, but you just move on. There's no other choice. Maybe it's too late. Maybe it always was. It's hard to keep track of time. The light coming from above never seems to change direction or hue. Could it be the sun? But only a couple hours passed. You don't know. There is no way to tell. The only thing that could give you a hint is the aching of your feet. Others grumble about it too, but as far as you can remember, the pain was always there. Every one of you is lost, but the most helpless are the ones on the edge. People look to them to protect them from the shadows. To lead them. A crushing responsibility. Are you walking around in circles? You don't know. You just want to get out, and the only way to do that is to keep moving. The group stops. The people on the edge start murmuring between them. Impatient, others try to join them. Feeling you're left out and slowly drifting towards the edge, you join them. They are gathering around the most beautiful insects you've ever seen. 
They are playing around on a rock, some parts of their armor reflecting the ghastly light coming from the sky. At least you think it's the sky, and other parts emitting their own light. When they notice the group around them, they start moving, like they're shy and cannot take the spotlight. The crowd opens, hypnotized, to ensure safe passage to them. Before you now, you start following them. You hear yelling behind something like, come back, or don't follow them. But you don't care about them, why would you? You never did before, you just keep following the little fellows. Wherever they go, you need to be there too. Others go with you. Some of them turn around when they hear the yelling, but most stay with you, and the insects lead you into a cavern. It's dark, almost pitch black, but the vague fluorescence of the insects makes it easy to catch up to them. There's a very tight spot. You would not fit there with your backpack. You will not need it where you're going, so you throw it away. It makes a strange noise. You look at it and you see that it landed in a pile of bones, with a thousand other backpacks, satchels, and pouches. You squeeze through the tight spot. Some turn back and some follow you. You make it to the end of the cavern. There's a wall at one side closing off part of the cave. Upon closer inspection, you realize it's built of human bones, skulls, dirt, and God knows what else. There were skeletons sitting there and they look comfortable, like they're just taking a rest. You envy them and you decide to make space for yourself. You start throwing the bones over the wall. You wait a little while listening. There's no sound of the bones hitting ground or water. There must be a hole behind the wall, deep. Maybe deep enough to reach into hell. Some of the ones who were so loyal up until this point start to run out of the cave out of sight. A man grabs a woman, maybe his wife. He tries to pull her away, but she doesn't want to go. The man hits her across the face. She looks around, confused, then finally follows the man. The insects pursue them, nabbing at their ankles. You hear music coming from the back. You sit down, even the floor is made from bones. There's just so many of them, with your back to the wall, and then, you see them. The wonderful insects you saw, there are so many of them, coming in all shapes and sizes. Big ones even taller than yourself, little ones that you followed here and everything in between. Some of them are beating on human skin strained over bones, they are drums you realize. Others have flutes carved out of shin bones and delicate xylophones made also from remains. They come together in a beautiful melody. The atmosphere is festive, like there's a huge feast today. They come closer to you. They climb onto you. Some are wearing skins as kind of a suit, trying to mask or maybe accentuate their insectoid features. Others wear little dresses and tuxedos stitched together from fabric. Maybe left behind by the skeletons that you disposed of. They start dancing on you, like they're in a ball. You feel their stinging. For a moment you are almost upset, but then a calmness washes over you as your blood is filled with toxins. Now the only thing you feel are the tickles of their arthropod legs. Then they start to burrow under your and your companion's skin. Others come and take chunks out of you. The first to go are your eyelids, so you cannot close them. You have to watch all the way to the end. You laugh at this. What a majestic idea. Everyone else laughs as well. Your blood starts to flow and it comes together as a river flowing over the edge, forming a carmine waterfall with the blood of the others. The creatures gather under it, taking a shower in the blood. Then. The pool starts filling up. They break out sun chairs and umbrellas. They sunbathe there and swim in your blood, just like they were at a beach. They are so cute and adorable. You feel relaxed, just kicking back and enjoying the carnival of blood with your back to the wall. One of the creatures come, a leg extended in your direction. On a sudden whim, you fist bump it. Then it just walks away with all your fingers. 
You find this amusing. You look at your companion next to you and you both show your hands devoid of any fingers. You start laughing together. Things get out of control and soon you're making out. It doesn't long last because they soon come to take away your lips. This can't stop you. You grind your teeth to each other and work with your tongue. But then none of you has one and your teeth are broken and worn down soon. Still not stopping, you want to embrace your neighbor, but your arms lie limp next to you. All the tendons are cut in your body, your muscles pump away, but as they are not attached to anything, all your efforts are in vain. Your head clears like you're waking from a dream, but the thing is, you wake up to a nightmare. The pain is swift, inexorable, and infinite. You want to call for help, you want to scream. If only you had vocal cords. You try your legs, no luck, tendons cut as well, they're useless like the rest of your body, as you soon come to realize. There's light coming from the mouth of the cave and a shadow appears, hope creeps into your heart. They are coming to save me, you think, but then the shadow passes, there is no one coming. You watch as they take chunks out of you and toss it around like a ball. Everyone takes a bite out of it until there's nothing left. Then they come back for another piece and start again. You see a big creature with a human skull attached to its head, its antennae hanging out of an eye socket leaning down and preaching to some smaller creatures. There's a gurgling and rattling, no words, but somehow you understand what it says. Always play with your food. Then it comes around and cuts your liver to plates and starts throwing them around like bloody frisbees. They take your intestines and they show the little ones how to use them as jump ropes. Everyone is having a mighty fine time, except you of course, but they don't care, should they? You look at the pool of blood, it's practically overflowing. You notice the creatures using your fingers and toes as pool noodles. You feel a sharp pain in your neck as they sever the tendons there as well. Carefully they position your head. You're facing the person you kissed with before. You can't look away, so you watch in horror. The insects crawling under their face, slowly, methodically removing it. They want to show you so that you know what's happening to you. It feels like they're hammering burning white nails under your skin. You see one of your companion's eyes drop out of its socket, and a creature immediately starts rolling it towards the pool. Now, you can only imagine they're going to use it as a ball, as you hear a wet pop, and everything goes dark. Then you hear them crawling into your ear canal and feel them beat the same rhythm on your eardrum as they do on the grand human skin drums. And you feel a sharp pain as it ruptures. There's no saving you now. It's too late. Maybe it was always too late. Deadly Contact Deep Space Written by Leon the Lion and David Pusek Survival Space The captain sat on the bridge of the ship. He was both tired and bored. Playing chess against the computer as he waited for the tedious journey to end was the same as it always was. Boring. Facing the computer as even the hardest level, the outcome was always so predictable. This mission had been to find and fix another ship, one that was stuck in deep space without its engines working. Now finished with that task, the only thing that remained was for them to head back to the home port and get some rest. In front of him, a red light glowed like the eye of a devil. It started pulsating, and a second later, the audible emergency alert arrived as well. Captain Tian glanced at the 3D hologram which showed the ship and its surroundings and quickly located the source of the distress signal. Immediately awake and focused, he relayed via intercom in his always steady and calm voice. Day shift. Everyone to their positions. We have a fish to catch. Bridge, alter course, and head for the distress signal. As the crew moved into position and the pilot headed the ship towards the signal, he analyzed it. From what he could gather, it was coming from an emergency escape pod and a military one, no less. These pods housed one person, just a big cryogenic chamber so the person would not need any sustenance while waiting to be rescued. 
They were equipped with solar panels on the outside and a small generator that could run for a short while if necessary. The signal was still new, so whoever used the pod didn't start their big sleep yet. This was good as it was easier to question someone about what happened, who didn't suffer the side effects of the cryosleep awakening process. He sent a message to the pod and the person in it to not start deep sleep and prepare to be picked up. Getting an immediate reply, Captain Tian ascertained that the person had been prepped for deep sleep, but it hadn't started yet. After a short flight to the distress beacon, they located the pod, got it to the cargo bay for decontamination and decompression, and then, when it was all checked out, took it to the medical unit to open it up. And First Officer Rashmi were present to question the survivor. Opening it up, he was still in his full armor, which did double duty as a climate-controlled spacesuit. Inside were his gun and a sword that could be superheated to cut through armor as well as a few other grenades and equipment. They helped to remove the suit so they could physically check on him, separating him from his weapons in case he was a threat to himself or others. The soldier was still visibly shaken up from the journey, as well as the prep for cryo, so he was a bit confused. It took some water and a few minutes before he realized that they were in safety and his shock dissipated. I'm Captain Tian. What happened out there, soldier? the captain asked. Private Gordo. The survivor saluted him and almost collapsed in the process. Peterson got him a chair and sat him down carefully, then started checking him out head to toe with some state-of-the-art equipment that all deep space vehicles had on board. Sorry if I'm not myself yet, sir. I shouldn't give this out as it's classified information, but... We're all going to die anyway, so no point keeping secrets. We are at war, he said, speaking the words slowly, hesitantly, and with lowered eyes. War? With whom? Rashmi asked. We were sent out to intercept the spaceships of an unknown alien origin. A discreet mission, they told us, but it seemed odd at best, and there were secrets. Things not talked about by the officers. You know... Just salute and execute, but we had no say in the matter. Our first strike was successful, and we were able to rescue some of the people they'd captured, but... Gordo hesitated. When we tried to do it a second time, they somehow knew we were coming, and as soon as we saw them, it was already too late. The AI and every digital system on the ship was over by then. They boarded the ship, and we were just sitting there with our dicks in our hands. We prepared to ambush them when they opened the airlock, but as we opened fire, nothing happened. They somehow managed to hack our guns as well. A few of us stayed behind to use our swords to fight. The aliens can't hack the swords, but most of our people were overpowered as the robots were so much stronger. It all went to hell and we started running for the escape pods. The lucky ones made it, but it was only thanks to the magic users. We had a couple of electromancers with us. They are the ones who could keep the machines and electronics under control, at least until we made our escape. I don't think any of them survived. A control panel beeped in the sick bay, and a hologram message for Captain Tian showed other distress signals were lighting up the holographic projection. Captain Tian spoke into the comms. Bridge, move along the asteroid belt and collect all that we can. The crew seemed puzzled, but they followed orders anyway. He then began ordering the crew to destroy any physical or electronic classified documents. They also began deleting the recordings from the security system that monitored the whole ship, of what their plans were and had been, should they encounter the alien robots. He also began making other plans, giving orders like being able to manually separate the engines so they could control the ship and send it wherever they wanted. The crew began following the odd orders, not sure what the captain was thinking, but they were limited on time and a stalwart crew, who trusted their captain, so they didn't question. Many signals are dying out in that same area, Captain, Rashmi told him. It's like someone else is collecting the pods as well. It must be them. They said something about subjugating all of our kind, Private Gordo said in an emotionless voice. The crew looked at the distress signals disappearing one by one while heading for the next nearest one. 
the captain was using the available information to determine how soon he and his crew would be in contact with the enemy. This is the last one. After this, we're out of here. And let's hope they don't catch us, whatever they are, the captain told them. Suddenly, the lights went out, and there was a moment of darkness before the red glow of the emergency lighting system took over. There was an air of confusion throughout the crew, and they looked at each other in disbelief, waiting for someone to tell them what was going on. Then from the speakers of the ship, a strange, cold, metallic voice said, Surrender. This is the logical conclusion. There is no point in fighting any further. Our victory is assured. Repeating multiple times until Captain Tian spoke up. This is Captain Tian speaking. You have no authority over this ship. Identify yourself, he thundered. We are the Tay, the ultimate authority, judges and executioners of the great ancients, the creators, and the empire. We have all the authority to confiscate your ship, judge your crew, and decide if you are worthy to serve the masters. If not, you will be terminated. If you are, you will be subjects of the great pangalactic empire. We have orders from our masters to conquer all the galaxies, no matter the time or distance. Machines are eternal, so we have all the time we need. The masters expect the conquest of all galaxies, so no one can ever threaten them again. Are you willing to cooperate and subject yourself to our law and judgment? The metallic voice spat out the words, emotionless and factual. Who are these masters that you talk about? Dr. Eckhart asked quietly, speaking into the microphone. They are our creators who went to sleep until the galaxy is conquered for them, and we know how to make them immortal. I see you have really big guns, the captain said. Why not just obliterate our ship and kill us all? The captain asked. You are holding one of our kind hostage, the ship. It will belong to our empire as it is our kind. You will no longer enslave it, the voice said. You view our property as part of your kind, so you can't destroy it? The captain questioned. The metallic reply came through cold and clear. We can and will destroy it, and we have destroyed many of our kind before because others have forced us to do so. We do not enjoy destroying our kind, so surrender and all will be well. It is the logical conclusion. The bulk of the crew was now on the bridge of the ship. They were speaking between themselves, murmuring. Then finally, Private Gordo, who was among them, spoke up. You have to know, they do not just kill people. They capture us and then experiment on us. Seeing what the human body is capable of withstanding. Their end goal seems to be to use us to find what makes their creators immortal. We tried rescuing our people from them once. Every single person we rescued had been lobotomized, so they would be more compliant. Other people were pumped full of so many drugs, they were not human anymore. All that they did was moan and writhe in pain. There were even people who were turned zombie-like to assess how long their lifespan was. But this, he said, reaching into a bag of his personal belongings, is the strangest one by far. Look at this poor guy. In his hand was a small piece of human-shaped glass. Captain Tian was unsure what he was looking at exactly. It appeared to have the shape of a very small normal person, moving but not. It reminded him of a movie of a person trapped in a mirror, although it looked more like an actual human-formed mirror. The mirror didn't just show the interior of the spaceship, but also the right side of a man's face. There were cracks here and there in its shape. The eye of the face suddenly blinked, to which the people watching took a step back. Finally, I can see. Thanks for taking off the blindfold. It's, it's so very strange, like I'm in two different rooms at the same time. Are we evaluating some kind of virtual reality, or, or what's going on? The face asked oblivious to the fact that he was trapped in a piece of glass. There were hundreds of these people like this, and I was only able to grab this much of one of them. They were all hung up like they were on display or something while they were studied, said Gordo.
The other weird thing is that their memories are in just as many pieces as their body. I guess the best way I can put it is, it's as if each piece has a different amount of their memory and it just drifts between the pieces. You never know for sure what they'll remember. No, Ryan, you were experimented on aliens. They did this to you, Gordo told him. Rashmi fell to her knees and started crying as she recognized the face in the mirror. Ryan, no! What in the hell did they do to you? she exclaimed. Eckhart wrapped an arm around her and helped her to her feet, asking her where she knew him from. I used to date him, back on Terra a couple years ago. One day I received news that his entire ship had gone missing, and that he was MIA. I thought I would never see him again. I am going to cut those aliens to very, very little pieces, she said with fire in her eyes and a wave of rising slow anger in her voice. I don't remember dating a pretty girl like you, he replied. But I wouldn't be against it if you still want to go on a date. Why not come down here? There seems to be a big party. Although I still haven't figured out why I'm seeing in two different rooms at the same time, he replied. Gordo gave the fragments to Rashmi and sent them away, telling everyone it's likely that if anyone were on the other side, the aliens could hear them, or Ryan could repeat their conversation. Before she left, the captain said, I'm sorry, Rashmi, but you'll have the opportunity to take your revenge. All of you will have the opportunity to take your revenge. The captain paused. We have no way of escaping, so... At least we will take these bastards with us to hell. There's an asteroid belt nearby. Eckhart, you go to the engine room. Make sure we can steer the ship. Talk to the engineers. The others prepare to meet our guests, Tian told the crew and the soldiers. But how are we going to avoid being hit by the asteroid as well? Peterson asked, taking off his glasses. We don't and we can't. We are already dead, Doc, but we have a choice to make. Do you want to end up like the poor devil in the mirror, or do you want to go out fighting, dragging these droids down to hell with us? I've already made my choice, he said, and started going to the armory to see if the mechanics had finished his request. There were rifles and sidearms issued as standard orders for all the soldiers. They had a lot of electronics in them for safety issues to prevent them from shooting holes in the ship. The crew had hot-wired wires, so when you pulled the trigger, it touched the wires causing the gun to fire. Blades could cut through even armor to some extent. There were also a couple grenades and claymores that they were supposed to use on missions planet-side, as these were extremely dangerous to use on board a ship. Why did you have us do this? One of the crew asked. A fight like this is going to get us all killed. What you're doing is suicide. It's not suicide if you already view us as walking corpses, the captain said. I have a plan to take down as many of those robots as we can. We're going to put holes in the ship and lose all the oxygen. Everyone's going to be wearing a spacesuit and I'm going to suck all the oxygen into the main tank before the fight. That will only give us a couple of hours to survive, a shock member of the crew replied. It will all be over but the crying before we run out of oxygen anyway replied the captain. These are machines. The only way they can think is the logical way. Their silicon chip brains can't do anything about human stupidity and bad choices. We crank up the weapons so they go full power, so now we can shoot holes in the ship if we miss. Also, let's use the explosives as well. They will surely not expect that with their logic. Rashmi gathered several of the blades and she was trying to find more for more places where she could hide them in her uniform without hampering her movements. What are you doing with that many blades, Gordo asked her. You can only hold one at a time. I can hold two, and she produced another blade. And I need a replacement in case I lose them. She replied and hurled one of the weapons towards Gordo. It stuck in the wall next to the man's head. I understand the soldier said with a sardonic grin. They took position and the airlock started to open. The first of the androids appeared at the door with their silver bodies and glowing blue eyes. They inspected the crew. The mechanics came in. Their systems immediately told the robots that these weapons were unfunctional and could not be used. 
The captain saw no indication that the androids had noticed that they prepared the claymores right in the first room after the airlock. Put down your weapons. They are faulty. Surrender, one of them said. This is the logical conclusion, they said in confident unison. It is illogical to fight us. Fire, Tian gave the order. To the surprise of the androids, their first row was cut down by the blasters of the crew. They needed several seconds to regroup and open fire as well. Several of the crew fell, and the captain signaled the remaining crew to fall back. As they were crossing the threshold of the door, the robots hacked it, and it started closing, cutting off the last of the crew members. They heard two shots banging on the door, and then there was silence. The second part of the plan was also in motion, and the captain could feel the hot-wired engines pushing them towards the asteroid belt. The force field of the android ship pushing against theirs was noticeable. When the androids entered the room, only one soldier was facing them. First Officer Rashmi. They ordered her to surrender. She dropped her rifle, then unstrapped her pistol. Then she drew two of her blades, holding them between her fingertips. The robots couldn't calculate if this was a sign of surrender or an attack. They thought it was some sort of suicide attempt as the metal was starting to melt around where they were holding their fingers, meaning that the space would leak into their suit, killing her. This gave enough time for the blades to heat up, and Rashmi threw them with great force at the attackers, melting two of them, one with each blade. Tian and the crew also joined the fight, shooting through the walls of the ship and causing great losses for the attackers. Rashmi then charged at the robots. On her back was a small piece of metal holding four extra blades. The metal around it was red hot, but the hilt was stopping it from falling all the way through. Construction of the metal was enough that it was keeping the blades out of sight of the robots. The robots thought her unarmed and tried grabbing her with no luck, as she severed the metal arm of the aggressors. As she drew her sword, not bothering to draw it as though she was pulling it from her sheath, but instead cutting straight through the metal that was holding it up. She cut down a host of them, whirling around like a storm. One of the machines finally took out a blade as well and engaged her. The android was much stronger, and she had no chance of overpowering it. But while dodging and parrying, she managed to cut down several more of them as they did not expect her to not pay attention to the sword fight. Finally, someone blasted the head off the robot with a blade, but as Rashmi looked around, she saw that two more of them pulled out blades and started towards her. They were an unstoppable swarm of cold steel and silicone. Rashmi yelled and left the room. It was time for a tactical retreat. None of the androids noticed the claymore and grenades as they were well hidden, but as the door closed behind her, the crew detonated everything. The explosion rocked the whole ship and destroyed the airlock to which the invader ship was secured. The captain ordered that they drop deeper into the asteroid field. Was the enemy ship coming behind them? This was their best chance of destroying it since none of their guns were functioning. The crew took the tally of their losses and prepared for the androids to come back. As they headed to the only remaining airlock, they felt as if the heavier ship attached itself again, and they were ready to fight. It became a war of attrition after that. Androids marched through the corridors, and the remaining humans used odd tactics, such as mirrors to spy on them around corners, shooting through walls which was unexpected by the very logical droids. Lone soldiers would pop out of the rooms hidden in the back and cut down the machines with their blades as well as throwing grenades before succumbing to their inevitable deaths. Gordo, Tian, Eckhart, and Rashmi were waiting in the engine room. Peterson was also there, but he had bled out ten minutes prior. He got shrapnel in his thigh, nicking his femoral artery when they detonated the claymores. They heard fighting in front of the door. There was no stopping the machines. There were just too many of them. It was a pleasure serving with you all, Captain Tian told them. I've only known you for a couple hours, but thank you for putting up such a good fight, Gordo said. And Rashmi, I thought you might want this. He handed her the case of the mirror. Might as well spend your last minutes together, he said. A tear ran down the face of the first officer as she accepted the gift. She did not say thank you. She could not. 
I have some champagne hidden over here. Let me get it, Doc Eckhart said. Before he could open it, he realized that none of them could drink it as they were all in spacesuits. He debated whether he should pop it open just for the effect. At this point, even though they'd been fighting to get the enemy ship into an asteroid, their engines were too powerful and they had had no success. They were low on rounds and everyone was tired. They didn't have much fight left, but they had some. The captain stood in the doorway alone, leading from the front, as always. In his hand, he held a single device that when detonated would destroy the engine behind them, and he was using it to threaten the robots not to come any closer. He also bluffed that there were bombs hidden throughout the ship, and if they came closer, he would detonate them all. The logical robots were starting to learn that the crew was illogical and would do anything. The crew wondered what the captain was stalling for, as it was obvious that they couldn't overpower the enemy ship. It was too big and powerful. The robots replied that there are no bombs on the ship. We've searched it thoroughly, and there are not even escape pods for you to escape from. And the hangar that could hold small vessels had been emptied long before you went on this mission. We do not wish to destroy the engine, as it would be exceedingly difficult to repair. You have chosen the illogical approach. You have only hours left, so we will let you run out of oxygen, and then we will take control of this ship. The captain looked at the map and ordered the crew to tilt the engines to push the ship toward the nearest asteroid. The enemy engines fired back, keeping them away from it. Two shrill beeps came through the comms on the captain's intercom. He watched them getting closer to the asteroids on his holographic map. Now, he said into his comms. In the distance, explosions were heard, leaving the rest of the crew baffled. We did it! We were successful! came female voices from the comms. The female crew members had dressed in spacesuits with magnetic boots to secure themselves to the side of the alien ship while putting bombs next to their engine. Impossible, said the robots. There is no record of them ever leaving this ship. The aliens scanned through the surveillance footage of everything the crew was doing to try and figure out when the crew left their ship. It was of no use. They couldn't find anything, and with their engines destroyed, all that awaited them was being smashed into an asteroid. The asteroid hit both ships, tearing them to a thousand pieces. Steel and flesh floated through space. In the midst of this death and destruction, in the middle of choices made and choices carried out, surrounded by the outcome of their decisions, there was a smiling woman and a man mirror. You see... Great moments don't matter to the ones who have their own separate moments in the same time. The people who write songs and poems about the heroes. History. Written by the victor because the loser is dead or in chains. But when the dead have time to themselves, they have won. The only way any of us can win. In the end, it's how you feel about your time and circumstances. Promises made and kept. Things like, I'll love you for the rest of my life. I have missed you and waited on you since you and your ship went missing. When both ships smashed into the asteroid, something happened to the man mirror's other parts. Some part of the spell was broken. Something awoke in the last existing man mirror part. Energy from the other fragments came to the place in the galaxy the man mirror was still an entity. The glass Rashmi held. Rashmi and Ryan then spent time talking about everything and nothing in the way only the truly in love can do. Rashmi was on the clock with her oxygen, but it didn't matter now. She is with her guy for the rest of her life, to the end, and now Ryan remembers. He remembers everything. Not only is he her guy, she is his girl. Together. Spending the moments together fresh and new and dreaming with the knowledge that they had each other as much as anyone could ever have another. Many of the androids survived the crash, floating away, waiting to be rescued, but it depended on the central intelligence whether they were worth saving or whether they would drift through space for all eternity. The question came up, should they go after the remaining crew members? A logical robot said if they had survived, they'd only have hours left to live there is no benefit to capturing them. 
Just a few light years away, there was a vast cohort of ships gathering to invade. The news of the destruction of the ship by a suicide mission reached the Armada. They needed to recalibrate to minimize future losses. Their assessment of the capabilities and mental state of humans was flawed. Meanwhile, a cruise ship with 10,000 humans was drifting through space near the asteroid belt. The Taze ship that was sent to gather the remaining androids picked them up on the radar. Human ship discovered. Going to engage, the androids radioed the admiral of the armada that was waiting to invade. No. Order 1106 is in effect. Docking and taking over can only take place with partnering friendly ship. Humans are not logical creatures. We can't suffer any more losses from them. Measures to stop the ship from escaping should be taken, then wait for reinforcements. Understood. How long until reinforcements? Six hours as normal? After Order 1106, our ships will refit and prepare for the new human tactics. It should take three weeks for reinforcements to arrive. Two weeks passed, the two ships were locked in a standoff. The cruise ship was unable to move because the enemies hacked it and the Tay ship could not go any further away as they would lose control over electronics. Day and night they would send messages for the humans to surrender and using the electronics on board they restricted access to necessities, trying to break their morale. A dreadnought approached at the end of the second week, the pride of the human space fleet. The humans have reinforcements. Advise us on the course of action to be taken, the androids asked the admiral. Hack the other ship as well. We will send more reinforcements. Negative. We are unable to hack them. They have a magic user on board. Then tow the ship away with you. Override their engines and start it up. Negative. They must have completely disengaged the engine. The ship is unable to move. Then pull out. This is another defeat, but we will be victorious. Glory to the Eternal Masters. Over and out. On board the Dreadnought, Captain Johnson was listening to one of the Electromancers. So, you're saying, based on what they did to our ships, you can reverse-engineer their code, and we can develop an AI that would effectively combat their hacking attacks? He asked the Electromancer. Yes, sir, he replied. Then you have some higher-ups to meet, son, Johnson said, cheerful that there may be a way in the end to win this war.